Welcome today to Spirit Truth Fellowship. My name is Ed. And today we'll be talking about abuses in the Gospel of John. There's many different forms of abuse, and I'm not saying one is more important or less important than the others, but today I want to talk about abuse, um, basically spiritual abuse. So there's all different um, forms of abuse. I'll just go these really quickly. First of all, there's just the proper use of something, just misuse something, you abuse you're using a, something for a hammer and end up, end up breaking whatever you're using. And of course, there's animal abuse or people treat animals or people in a cruel way. That's, that's abuse. And then the gossip is in a sense of if you insult somebody. It's an offensive way of talking, that abuse of speaking to one another. And then these are a bunch of other ones being passive and not taking care of somebody's needs. Passive abuse, physical abuse, sexual, verbal abuse, psychological abuse, you know, playing somebody's mind, emotional abuse, intellectual abuse, and spiritual abuse. And that's what I want to uh, focus on today, um, is spiritual abuse. And it often happens when someone is punished for having different understandings, different beliefs, maybe ridiculed for their beliefs and things like that. So that's what I want to talk about. It actually is in the book of John, and I'll be reading from the revised English version that um, we use at Spirit of Truth Fellowships. It's just an excellent commentaries. And some of the things that we're going to be sharing will be taken from commentaries that John has there. So we're looking specifically in John chapter 9, and it's about Jesus heals a man born blind. Now, I'm, I'm giving this man the name Blake. And the reason I'm doing that is to make him more real to us. Knowing a person's name is so, so important. And developing a relationship with somebody is, is to me, is more important than just sharing the gospel and just speaking out and not knowing where a person's at. And I've had experiences with, with people who um, don't really know the person, don't know where they're at, and then starts giving their agenda, uh, but knowing the person's name. So I'm gonna call him Blake during this. There's no particular reason why I'm going to call him Blake. So we're going to be looking at uh, John chapter 9. And instead of the man born blind, I've given it a name Blake. So I'll be reading this and then sharing some of my thoughts and on my journey as, as a Christian. And I believe I'm I'm not arrived, but I where I'm at is where I'm at today. And hopefully in a year from now, I'll know Jesus more and maybe things that I thought were true uh, I realized way that may be partly true, but I want to know more about the truth. In pursuing the truth, you never have to fear that. If something is true, the more you study the truth, the more it be real. If it's not true, and but you're not really sure, you're not willing to study it and find out is this really really true, then you're stuck. And I don't I don't want to be in that position. I, so I want to be a learner, and I want to continue learning. So here's uh, John chapter nine. And some of my comments where I am as far as we are uh, today. As he passed by, he, that's Jesus, saw Blake, a man blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, so that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, neither did Blake sin, nor his parents, but let the words of God be revealed to him. Now, already I've spotted a number of spiritual abuses that have taken place. And as we go through this, I hopefully that you'll see them, some lightly, some, some you know, pretty bad. Um, first of all, when Jesus, um, when Jesus saw him, he saw Blake as a blind man. But when the disciples, when the disciples saw him, they saw him, someone that was punished by God. And this is uh, something that was very, in their culture, if something went bad, it means that you sinned or you, there was hidden sin and God was punishing you. And then, of course, if something went, went well, then it, that means that you were doing good and God is blessing you. And to, agree, to some degree, there's some truth in that, but that certainly isn't how God operates. It's not just waiting for you to do something bad, now he's going to get you. That thought is still today, Christians today, that 
if something bad happened to them, then we think, oh, something was wrong with that person. And that's what they did. So they didn't see, the, his disciples didn't see this blind man as somebody to be relationship with. They saw him as somebody to discuss theology with, whatever, the, with their agenda. They were talking to Jesus. So who sinned? Now, it made God look bad. When I, when I was first um, exposed to that particular teaching, the second part in, in a number of Bible verses uh, says, this happens so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And I'm thinking, what? That God had this baby born blind. So when years later, and Jesus came along, then they would show, wow, isn't, God, isn't Jesus wonderful that God's working a miracle through Jesus? To me, that's a terrible, terrible teaching that I had, that he was born blind, God caused his blindness so that Jesus could heal him. And Jesus just said, no, 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 no. This is not the case. Neither he sinned nor his parents sinned. But he said, let the works of God be revealed in him. So the Jesus, saw, Jesus saw this man as someone to be concerned about for his blindness. But the disciples saw him as someone to to talk about a spiritual debate about this, but not as a person that God loves. And that's something that, that I want to do is see people as God loves them. Now, there are beggars all over the place. And my first inclination is like, okay, why did you get yourself in this position? And it, you know, maybe because you it misused alcohol or drugs or whatever, and not to have pity for him. But this person, if, he, if that was true, if that was true, and they're still hungry, they still need a place to live, they need a place to eat food. So my attitude uh, needs to be soft and, and, and see the person as a real person, as someone that God loves. And in a sense, it's a, a way to bless them. Uh, is what I'm going to be trying to do right now. So Jesus said, we must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one will be able to work. You know, a lot of translations, the King James, the Dewey Reigns, and a bunch of translations, they don't use the word we. They they mistranslate it. And to me, that's abuse when you, when the, the text, the Greek, the is I must do the works of him. It's not in there. It's we must do the works of him. And it, it almost so that, that Jesus can do this, but we can't. And uh <laughs> and Jesus says, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Matthew 5 and 14 to 26, it also says, Jesus says this, you are the light of the world. And it says, let your light shine before men that they might see what? Your good works and then bring honor and glory to the Father. So Jesus, he was sent by God and then he sends us to do the, the works of God. So Jesus certainly is the light of the world. He came into darkness and he brought light. But then we are also light of the world. And, and so the light, the light that's in us shine. And that's, that's just a wonderful way of, of looking at life. So when he said this, he spat on the ground, made mud out of the spittle and put the mud on Blake's eyes. Now the scriptures, the scriptures don't tell us what all that what's going on. But first of all, I just want to give you a background. It was the Sabbath, and he just he just left the temple. We'll read that in a few minutes. And what he did, he did something that was really, really unusual. And I'm sure he, he talked to Blake and said, Blake, this is Jesus, um, and I'm just making this up, but I think it's quite possible that God told me that you can be healed of your blindness. But I have to do something that's really, really weird, and I do it. And he says, what? He says, I'm, I'm going to make some mud and I'm going to work it together. Then I'm going to put it on your eyes and then I'm going to ask you to, to walk and, and wash it off. Can I do that? <laughs> and uh, of course he did. And he and then here's, here's Blake. Jesus is doing all this work. He's making the mud and then he's, and he's going to put it on on his eyes. Now the blind man is walking with mud dripping from his face, walking through the, the streets, going to the pool of Siloam. 
and how embarrassing that is. People might have laughed at him and whatever he has to do. But this is what God told Jesus. Now, there isn't any other times before or after that where this is what this is the formula for somebody's blind. You spit on the ground, make some mud, work, work the mud, and then you put it on the guy's eyes, and then you tell him go wash. <laughs> and he'll be healed. One time we had a group at our home, it was a home group, and there was a gentleman that was there, and he had a hard, hard time hearing. And so we were praying about it, about his, that wasn't he wanted prayer because he couldn't hear well. And I got this really strange thought that if he wanted to be well, to blow in his ear. No, there's, there's no scripture that says somebody can't hear, they just blow in your ear. So I, I was just a little nervous about that. And so I said to the person that was with me, because we were play, praying together, I said, I get this real strange thought about praying for him. And I thought the Spirit of God was saying, blow in his ear. And he said, oh, I had the same, very same thought. <laughs> I thought the same thing. So then we said to the gentleman, I said, look, this is really strange, but this is what we feel God said. If you... You want your hearing uh, to improve and get better, then God is telling us to blow in yours. Can we do that? And what do you think he said? He said, yes. So he was on one side and I was on the other side. We both blew into his ears and his healing began. He was able to hear and I was perfectly amazed. Now, I've never, never prayed for anybody again. Uh, like blowing in the ears. It wasn't now a formula for people that are deaf or going deaf, but God did that. And he did it with Jesus and he did it with me. And I was so blessed. And so then there, there's this, said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And what does Blake do? He does it. So we went back and washed and he came back seeing. And so here there was something that, two things that Jesus asked him to do. One, can I put this mud on your on your eyes? And two, go go and wash. So there were, there was some degree of faith that he had that Jesus said to do this, and he would, he would allow Jesus to do it. And then he walked through the streets to the pool of Siloam. So there was some degree on on, on his part of faith that he was to do that. And often we see that there is some test, if we will of what God's asking us to do. And we're willing to do that in our prayer. We're asking the person that's receiving prayer to do something. So that's what he did. He went, he went washed and came back seen. Now, could you imagine um, what happened to him? The first time he's, in, he's a man, he's an adult or a young adult. And he's seeing, he's seeing voices that he heard before. Now he sees who they are. He's so excited and I'm probably jumping up and down. I can see, I can see. And he's just so excited. And of course, this, this would be spreading really fast, really fast. And then verse eight says, therefore the neighbors and those that had seen Blake before and, and, and that he was a beggar were saying, isn't this Blake who sat and begged? And you know, his face of expression was different. He was full of joy. It was just so wonderful that God worked through Jesus and gave him the sight. What happens next? Others are saying, it is Blake. Well, others were saying, no, but he's like Blake. But Blake kept saying, I am he, I am he. I'm he, it's me, I'm Blake, I'm he, I'm me. By the way, which is ego and mean, and nobody thought he was referring to the Exodus, that he was now claiming to be God, but he was saying the same thing that Jesus said later on in John, but that's just a side issue. But he kept saying, I am he, I am he. So then they said to Blake, that how are your eyes open? So they want to know his story, which is wonderful. And he wants to tell them what his story, his story is. And then he did. He said, the man who is called Jesus, so Jesus would identify himself, and what he was doing made mud and spread on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam. And washed. So I went and washed and I received my sight. Now, Jesus did a couple of things um, that he probably should have done according to the Jewish culture and customs and the religion at the time. But he did some work on the Sabbath. And part of that work was kneading the, the mud and mixing it up together. You weren't supposed to do that. And so 
This was very unusual. And also to put mud on somebody's eyes, that was really, really unusual. Is, this, is that what God does? And this has never happened before, but he did it. And they said to Blake, well, where is he? Well, Blake wouldn't know. Jesus didn't say, come back and see me or whatever. He didn't know. And that's what he said. I don't know what he did. Then he, when he kept saying, I am he, in back when we just read in John 9 and 9. And this is, this is what happens if you, we're an abusive system or we, we, we're maybe not even knowing it. We don't want to really, really listen to the truth. So here he's saying, I'm, I'm, I am him. I am him. Can't be, can't be. And they're thinking, on the Sabbath, this, whoever this guy was, he was doing, he was breaking the Sabbath by making mud. And he, this guy has to be a sinner. This guy, I don't understand this. They don't, so they won't listen to the truth. And we don't, when we're in that kind of a system, we don't really care about discussing something that's outside our comfort zone, like making mud, doing this on the Sabbath, washing in the pool of Siloam. So if, if things are presented to us, but we're in a closed system, and that we don't want to hear anything except the truth that has been told to us. And if somebody says, well, maybe that's not quite the way the scriptures are. We don't want to hear that. We cover our ears. No, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. And even though he told them over and over again what happened, they didn't really want to listen. And I don't want to be a person like that. I want to be able to hear. And if somebody has to pre present something to me that's different, and I never heard it before, it's, it's different from when I was brought up. I really, really want to search the truth. The Bereans did that. They listened eagerly to what Paul said, not suspiciously or not trying to find fault. They listened eagerly. And that's the kind of Christian I want to be. One who listens to the truth, listens to what is being spoken. And then what do I do? I search the scriptures to see if what, what like Paul said, is true. I search the scriptures and really study it. This is, this is a new concept. Now, if you don't do that, that's, that's where you're at. But you may be stuck in teaching that isn't necessarily true. And I really want to follow the truth like who Jesus is. So I've been trained, we've been trained to avoid any controversial thoughts and to let the leaders handle issues and problem people. And so even if, if you get a thought and you think, well, that's really different than what, what often I have people say this, they, they, especially when one thing I said something and these people, all people disagreeing. And one person said, but what if that is right? And instead of saying, well, let's search this out, let, let's add, share it, with, tell us why he thinks the way he did. Oh, that was probably from the devil. Why do I even think that? And that's what we tend to do, or some people tend to do, is to avoid any these thoughts that we have that go against what we've been taught for years and years and years and not merely explore the truth. And we might even credit that not to the spirit of God trying to teach us truth, but to the devil who's trying to keep us from knowing the truth. So critical thinking is really discouraged to really examine the scriptures. Although the scriptures tell us to do that, be confident in your own self when you believe, make sure it's true, but it's often discouraged and what we are told to do is trust the teacher, the leader. And, and that's the expected norm. Not to challenge, not to question, not to think for yourselves. And so critical thinking is not something that's encouraged. And myself, that's what I want to do. I want to look at what's being said, accept it. This is what they're saying eagerly. And then examine it to say, is this does this really line up with scripture? And of course, the hardest thing is, if I've been told something year after year after year after year, then to say, well, wait a second, I have to undo that. And that's the hardest thing when truth is presented that goes against what we've, we've been growing up with. So what did they do? Well, they brought Blake to the Pharisees. These are the religious leaders and uh, let, let, let them deal with it. This doesn't make sense to us. He brought Blake to the Pharisees, the one who had been born blind. Now it was on the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened Blake's eyes. Now, I think the scriptures put that in there because that's the offense. The offense was that this man can't be from God because he's doing work on the Sabbath. The things that we said you couldn't do on the Sabbath. Remember, Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man. And the religious leaders had all kinds of add-ons and rules 
about Sabbath keeping that Jesus did not did not make or you know the, uh, the Father did not um, inspire, and Jesus realized no, it's better to do good or evil on the Sabbath, and of course it's too too good too good. But you know what they said? We're going to kill this guy. They plot to kill him when he healed on the Sabbath. So the Pharisees also were asking Blake how he received his sight. And Blake said to them, he told them a story, he put mud on my eyes, I wash and I see. And so some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. <laughs> there was no excitement about, about what he did at all. Another said, how is a man who is a sinner able to do such signs? So now even among the Pharisees, some are thinking, well, maybe this guy is from God. Maybe we should listen to him. And that was, boy, you don't want to be talking like that because, because the rest of the Pharisees, maybe you're the one or two Pharisees thought that, but the majority were supporting each other. And there was division among them. But that's, that most pastors and leaders, they don't want any division. You, you do what I tell you to do. You say what I say. You follow the instructions. And you, you're not a division maker. You're not a problem. You better be quiet. And that's that's the way it is. When the Pharisees were asking Blake how he see his sight, they were less genuine in their questioning. So they really didn't want to find out about Jesus. What they wanted to find out is would Blake say something to incriminate him or to incriminate Jesus? And often when people are asking questions, they're not really asking for answers. They're trying to find fault in your thinking or you think process or, or your Bible verses that you're using. That's and that's what they did. So they were looking not for answers, but ways to find fault with with Blake or or with Jesus. And of course, main fault they found was that he worked on the Sabbath and did broke the Sabbath. They showed no pleasure in Blake's miracle, miraculous healing. So they, they, they should be overjoyed. Here's this beggar that's been begging outside the synagogue for as long as he, he they know. There was no joy. There was no, wow, something really happened. Uh, they just discredited him and discredited Jesus. To me, it seems spiritual authority often dismissed, dis, diminishes this empathy, compassion, care for those under a person's control. So they, they don't see people as people. They see people as a problem because they're getting interfering with, with the, the way we've got this. Everything's under control. Everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing and saying what they're supposed to say and believing what they're supposed to believe. But if somebody doesn't, and they challenge our authority, challenge our teaching, then they're hard on that person. And if they feel attacked or we feel attacked, when somebody starts a conversation with us, we become defensive. Now, often this defensiveness, it easily flows to attacking and being abusive to the person that's sharing something new, something that's outside our box. So they said, again to Blake, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? And Blake said, he's a prophet. Now, why did he say that? Because in the Old Testament, human beings were empowered by God and they were prophets. Either they spoke what God was saying or they did things like God did. Like as Moses was a prophet, and he's, he wasn't God because he did all the various miracles you know, crossing the, the sea. It was not because something he did on his own. And that's what Jesus said. On my own, I can do nothing. I do what the Father tells me to do. I say what the Father speaks. So it would be normal for Blake to say, hey, God's working through this man, Jesus. Now, the Jews did not believe that Blake had been blind. And he received his sight. They didn't, now this can't be true. This is, can't be Blake. Maybe the guy was faking it all along. He just found a way of making money. And that might be a possibility, but it went against all of their thinking, what they thought. And so they wanted to call his parents. Now, his, of course, Blake is all excited. He's at home. Mom, it's me. It's Blake. I can see. I, I've never seen you. Look at you. Look at you. And the the all the guilt that they may have felt and the teachings and the culture that that he, the father or the mother, they did something wrong because God punished them for having a baby that wasn't able to see. And they were overjoyed. They were just wonderful. Wow, God did this through, through Jesus. And, and he would say, this man, Jesus, this is what he did. He put him out of my eyes. Well, it was absolutely wonderful, mom. Dad, I can see you. I love you. I love you. I love God. I love what he's doing through Jesus. 
And that's how they did. Now they're asking, now they're asking him, is this your son who you say was born blind? So now they're trying to incriminate them. Maybe this they was a way of making money off their son. Pretend you're blind, son, and you'll get money and bring it to us. Just horrible, horrible abuse of them and their integrity all these years that they were using their son. Now that could have been a possibility. Some people maybe actually do that. But this just shows that their heart, they're, when truth was presented, when God's doing something, uh, they were not willing to accept it. Their eyes are blind, their ears are not hearing, which was really, really sad. So then they said, so how did he see? Now you would think they would tell them, this man, Jesus, came up to him. He knew Blake before and said, Blake, you don't need to be, he to be blind. God wants to heal you today. And to put mud on your eyes, and I, I'll do it if you let me. I know it's a Sabbath, but if you do this today, wash the pool of some, you're going to be able to see. And his parents answered, we know Blake is our son, and Blake was born blind. And what did they do next? Well, they're not going to tell the truth. For most authoritarian leaders doing real research, truly listening to an opposite or different perspective is not just an option. They weren't there to hear about Jesus. They were there to find fault, find fault. So no matter what is said, no matter what evidence or is presented from a different understanding, it's just not accepted. Their ears are hearing, their eyes are not seeing, they're not willing to see the truth. And we become blind to truth because our, our presuppositions we want to hold on to that rather than be open to what God is doing in us and through us. So abusive systems, if you're in one, they really shun open discussions or formats to evaluate biblical evidence, especially to those that may in any way be contrary to their existing statement of faith. And that's what I found out in some relationships. So in verse 21, it says, and how does he now see? We do not know. Who opened his eyes? We do not know. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. Now, why are they saying this? They they know. The reason they're saying this is because of fear. And they don't want to be kicked out of the synagogue because that's what they've already were told. His parents and said these things because they were afraid. There's the fear of the religious leaders. But the Jews had already agreed, the religious leaders, if anyone confessed him to be the Christ, the Messiah, he'd be put out of the synagogue. So you be if you don't follow what we're saying, you're not going to be welcome here anymore. Now, the synagogue was, that was very central to their life. That was something, and being in relationship with all the people in synagogue. This was a major, major threat that was put over everybody in the synagogue. If anybody says Jesus is the Messiah, don't bother coming here anymore. And, and this still happens today. If we have a different understanding of who Jesus is than what the church says or the religious organization you're part of, then there's the threat that you will not be here anymore. You're not going to be speaking. You won't be part of this church system. That is why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So a second time they called Blake, who was blind, and said to him, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. But that's not what Jesus, that's not what the Blake did. Give glory to God. They were just saying, look, you're not following God. You're not following the, 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 our religious teachings. Today we say you're not following the Bible. Give glory to God. So abuse, abuse of leaders are not really true seekers. What they're committed to is their status quo, what the organization says, and their statement, keeping their statement of faith. They know that if they go against their statement of faith or what the organization says, their job would be in jeopardy. So they want to maintain that. They have an agenda, and they'll stick to it, even if it causes division in their church. So they'll separate those that don't agree with their statement of faith, those that don't agree that if Jesus is not the Messiah and you say he is, then now you're there. Well, what do I do if I agree that Jesus is the Messiah? Then we kicked out. So I have the decision to make. And sadly, more people choose to stay in the organization that is there's in that sense abusive, it's under fear, than saying, look, um, I'm going to stand up to truth, and if you kick me out, you kick me out. Getting rid of dissenters by attacking one's religious commitment to God, 
but to the Bible is the tactic. And what they're going for is peace in the group. We don't want dissenters, purity, keeping the truth, we maintain truth, and unity of the church. That's the goal. And then identify anybody that says speaks differently than what we've taught. They're they're dissenters or sinners. And there's one way to, to get rid of that problem is get rid of them. Identify them. Have to say, you can't speak in this church anymore. You're not welcome here. We don't want people talking to you. And that's exactly what happened. To me, that's abuse. Abusive leaders tend to use fear as their way to control people. And anyone not agreeing with their statement of faith, they wouldn't be considered a member or a guest. Now, they never tell people if, you know, a, a salvation a message is that you have to believe that, as an example, that there's one God, but that he's three persons. There's three people. They're all equal. and They're all God. They're all 100% God. You have to believe that. They, I've never, ever heard a gospel message saying, you must believe that. They would say this. But the truth is that God has a plan for your salvation. It's through Jesus. And accepting Jesus as God's plan for your salvation and believing that God raised him from the dead, as Romans 10 and 9 says, that's, that's the beginning. But then there's the bait and switch. Once you're in, now you have to believe that God is three persons in one. And if, unless you believe that, then you're really not a Christian. And you, you, and you, you tell people that, then you may even be called a heretic or kicked out of the church. Or you're welcome to come, but you're not going to be in any form of leadership. So if you don't agree with the statement of faith, you can come, you can be a guest, but we're certainly not going to give you any potential leadership position. Now, of course, People are told at the beginning, they can keep coming, they can give their offering, but they're never going to be in leadership roles. And if somebody was in leadership roles, they shared, hey, you know what? I I think different about Jesus. I think he's the Messiah then, or today, I think Jesus is the son of God, not God the son. That he is, is as Jesus said in John 17 and 3, there's only one true God. He's talking to the Father. There's only one true God and that it's necessary to know the true God. That's his father. And then me, Jesus. That's God's plan. And <laughs> you don't believe that. Don't say that. Um, you share something different than that, that you than what they believe. Then you're often called a sinner. You're dangerous. You're heretic. And the, and the messages don't have anything to do with that, that person. And we're not going to let that person share anything in, in our church because we believe that God is, is one person but it, in three persons and they're all equally God and so that's today so how do they do that the perceived threat to their power somehow must be eliminated and that that happened then and, and it happens today so to me if this is what happened in verse 25 it says Blake answered if he's a sinner I do not know one thing I do know is I was blind now I see and then they said to Blake what did he do to you how did he open your eyes Again, they, they don't believe it. How many times has he told them? Blake answered him, I've already told you and you did not hear. What do you want to hear it again? Do you, you too want to become his disciples too, do you? Oh boy, <laughs> Blake is already saying, listen, I'm following Jesus now. I want to be his disciple. And what do they said? They heaped insults on Blake. You are his disciples. We're disciples of Moses not this Jesus. So loyalty to the to the traditions often outweighs the importance to truth and blinds us to God's goodness and what God is all about and the truth that God wants us to know. Loyalty to a system blinds people to the real truth. I don't want to be part of that. It, it's risk-taking because if you share something that the group doesn't believe, then you're the heretic. You're the one that to be ostracized like they did to Blake. So extra effort then is made now to reinforce the accepted perspective. So now we really got to teach what we believe and then condemn the new perspective and those people that believe it, but who Jesus is that's different from what they're saying. And my, my experience is these leaders are not teachable. And they would resist any information that would say Jesus is something other than the person that they claim Jesus to be. Spiritual abusers, they may not call themselves that. They think they're, they think they're doing God's work. But they want to eliminate members or those members 
and make his or her attendance intolerable. Anybody that says Jesus is the Messiah, they're going to be kicked out of the synagogue. A similar thing happens today. And so this is how he, how he answered. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he's, he comes from. Now, we, they know he, he was from Galilee, but where did he get his power? That's what they didn't know. So Blake answered and said to them, well, that's amazing that you do not know where he is from, that where he gets his authorities, and yet he opened my eyes. Now, he made a statement here that's not quite true. He says, we know that God does not hear sinners. God does hear sinners that are seeking him. But if anyone is a worshiper of God, does his will, he hears him. Well, I'll tell you, God hears sinners. He tell, Scriptures tell us that he loved us while we we're yet sinners. But his perspective is that what he was taught, that God doesn't hear sinners. And so that was part of their culture. And so that's where he was coming from. Since the world began, it was never heard that anyone opened the eyes of the man born blind. If this man were not from God, he would not be able to do anything. And that's what Jesus said. Now, I myself, if I could not do anything, the thing that you see me do is because of the Father working in me. And the good thing is that the Father can work in you and do some of the things that Jesus said. Things that you see me do, Jesus said, do likewise. That's pretty exciting. He answered and said to Blake, you were born entirely in sin. And are you trying to teach us? They don't want anything to do with Blake. And what did they do? They cast Blake out physically, just threw him out. Get out of here. We're going to do with you. And this is what religious leaders do. And what did Jesus do? Well, rumor went around really fast that Blake was healed and people was a talk of, wow, he's everybody seeing him. Everybody knows what's happening. They knew Jesus was, the, was said to be the Messiah, that he believes Jesus is the Messiah. And, and, and Jesus heard this and, and they cast Blake out. And Jesus sought after him. And finding him, the work on Jesus' part. And then he said, do you believe in the Son of God, the Son of Man, rather? And that's, that's do you believe in the Messiah, who he said he was? And Blake said, and who is he, Lord? Meaning, sir, remember, Jake, Blake thought he was a man. Blake thought he was a prophet. Didn't think he was God or anything, but he was, this was a symbol of, you say something, think, who is he, sir? Tell me so I can believe in him. And Jesus said to Blake, you have both seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. Wow, what, what exciting news for Blake. You're the Messiah. You're the one that did this, and God's working through you. And Blake said, Lord, I believe. Now, this time when he's saying, Lord, he's saying, I, you're my Messiah. You're, the, you're, you're the, the one that, that we're all waiting for. You're the one that we're seeking, and I believe. And then, then what did he do? He bowed down before him, not as God, but as, as an agent of God, as one who has authority. This was this was showing respect to him. And Blake was so, so happy to meet the one that God worked through. And they cast Blake out. Yeah. When verbal abuse fails, and control must be maintained. Abusive leaders sometimes use physical violence to remove people from the presence, which is really, really sad. And then this is what Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see will see, and those who, are, who see that really don't will become blind. Now, I want to be the one who wants to see, and whatever blindness that's before me, I want to have that removed, and I want to see truth, and I want to be a, a true seeker and keep learning about who Jesus is, who the Father is, and how, he's, how I'm the light of the world that Jesus has said, and I can bring light to darkness in a way that's accepted, not abusive or controlling or bringing my agenda to the, to the story. Those are the Pharisees who heard, who heard, who were with him, who heard these things and said, we are not blind too, are we? No, I don't really think they're, they're asking. They're just saying, what are you accusing us about this? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now since you, you say, we see, your sins remain. So these are the ones that are saying, we know everything, but Jesus is saying no. So these are my take-homes from this teaching. And I, I hope they have they resonate with you. First of all, I really want to see individuals as people who God loves and wants us to be a blessing to everyone. So it doesn't matter if I, you have to, they're not, I, people today are not, are not on my agenda. I have to make sure this person says the sinner's prayer. 
before I leave. That's not my agenda. At one time, I was in an evangelical group that this is, you're always looking for bringing salvation. Of course, you want people to come and know Jesus, but I want to meet people where they're at, get to know them, love them. And there's a there's phrasing, though, if they know you first, they'll then you'll, they'll love your God after that. So that's what I want to do. Second takeaway is I really want to avoid maligning God or Jesus um, or other people. I, I don't want to do that. I, want to, I do want to say things about God or Jesus or other people. And that's not an easy thing to do, but that's one of my goals from seeing, reading John 9. And I want to see other, I want to see people like God sees people and he values them. For God so loved the world. Do I love the world or just those that will agree with me? Do I see people as sinners and they're getting what they deserve? Or do I see people as sinners who God loves and wants to bring them and free them from their blindness and, and come to a knowledge of truth? And I want to develop relationships first over defending my personal theology. And so relationships to me in the last few years, developing relationships is, is more and more important. And then the scripture said, Peter, if somebody asks you for the hope that you have, be willing to give it. And that, that's the best place when people come and ask you um, about why you think what you did. And I've had opportunities for that very thing to happen. And finally, I want to be a consistent learner and try to be open to new perspectives. And I want to learn and learn and learn. And where am I at my journey today? I, I want to be further in love with Jesus and find more about who God is and how he wants to use me for my kingdom. So I'd like to pray this for you in closing. Um, and for me, so Father, I just thank you for every opportunity that we have to be lovers of men, lovers of God, and to love people that you want us to love. Jesus, you said all the commandments, all the laws are summed up in this one way, love one another. And that's what I want to be. And that's my prayer for you and for me, that we will be lovers of people and in practical ways, show love to people, show kindness and the mercy and the gentleness of God, and not be judgmental, not being someone that might be a barrier or a block uh, to find out the truth. So I pray this for you, and I pray this for me, that God will work through the light that we're in, that we be a light and a way of love to bring people to further understanding and loving relationship with the God that we love. I pray this in Jesus' name. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being part of today's group. And just may God bless you this week.